Welcome to the spectacular maritime city of Portsmouth, a cradle of British nautical heritage and home to a variety of eye-catching seaside scenery. Located on an island just off England's south coast, Portsmouth is a huge, sprawling city of around 230,000 people, and it's actually the most densely populated single city in the UK outside of London, packed with people and centuries of history. On this walk we'll explore the oldest part of Portsmouth here on the seafront, but we actually begin by looking towards the most modern icon of the city, the soaring Spinnaker Tower. Designed and named after a type of sail, the Spinnaker Tower was completed in 2005 and it's quickly become a famous attraction in Portsmouth, overlooking the resplendent Portsmouth Harbour, into which there projects this small spit of land, known as Portsmouth Point. Although once used as the site of an important lookout and the Point gun battery watching over the harbour, Portsmouth Point was historically better known by the nickname Spice Island still born by the large 18th century pub in front of us here. But where did that name, Spice Island, come from? Well, while some theories suggest that this was a point of trade where exotic spices arrived into England centuries ago, it's more likely that the name was garnered owing to the rather seedy reputation of this part of Portsmouth by the 18th century. While it's now a calm, atmospheric area offering some gorgeous views of the harbour, Spice Island was once known as a hotbed of lawlessness, or the spice of life, as this area was left just on the outside of Portsmouth city walls, which were originally built in the 16th century. As such, many illicit pubs and taverns soon set up shop on this tiny part of land, serving as a haven for smugglers and later sailors on shore leave who were drawn to the hedonistic lifestyle of Spice Island. Brothels and inns once lining these streets would have been filled with sailors who'd been at sea for months or even years on end, although surprisingly, the large quantity of men enticed by these establishments actually made Spice Island a rather good recruiting ground for the Royal Navy, who would in dire times of war simply force men on Spice Island to join up without prior notice, simply to beef up Britain's maritime forces. Now we already know that Portsmouth is a cradle of British maritime heritage, with proud naval tradition running through the city's streets. But to get a better idea of why that's the case, we need to take a look at a map of exactly where Portsmouth is located. Situated on England's south coast just across the Solent from the Isle of Wight, Portsmouth, as we mentioned, is actually located on an island of its own, which is known as Port Sea Island. With modern-day urban sprawl, present-day Portsmouth has begun to spill out onto the British mainland off Portsea Island, however the city does still hold the distinction of being Britain's only island city, that is the only city located off of mainland Great Britain. Now Portsea Island is only about 10 square miles in size, but as home to over 200,000 people, it's an extremely densely populated area, and so we won't be able to cover all of Portsmouth on this walk today but we're going to focus our attention on this oldest area of the city down by the harbour, having started at Portsmouth Point, which is also known for more than its association with the spice of life. For centuries, a much discussed point among sailors for all manner of reasons, Portsmouth Point often appeared in naval logbooks aboard ships, and when written down, it was typically abbreviated as P-O stop, M-P stop, pronounced Pompey, which, as you might know, is the nickname that Portsmouth as a whole is known by today. There are other theories for the origins of that nickname, but as we mentioned earlier, the renowned Portsmouth Point once existed on the outside of Portsmouth's defensive walls, just a part of which we find here, overlooking the entrance to the harbour. Opposite us across the gorgeous blue water, we can see the town of Gosport, a separate naval town that grew in size with the emergence of Portsmouth's busy harbour. And it was from this point on this side of the harbour that a large chain connected to Gosport was historically raised and lowered to allow or prevent entry to the harbour. Now though, let's leave Spice Island and head into Portsmouth's vast complex of heavy coastal defences, some of which date back as many as 500 years. Owing to the city's strategic significance through history, Portsmouth's coastline has been heavily defended for centuries and in fact by the 19th century, when Britain's naval power reached its greatest extent, 
Portsmouth was by many measures the most heavily fortified city on the planet. By that point, the city's defences were a mishmash of different eras, but one of the oldest fortifications of all stands just before us here. This is the Round Tower, built all the way back in the 1490s under the reign of King Henry VII, and later repaired and refurbished during the Napoleonic Wars of the early 19th century. Amazingly, however, the tower's history actually goes back even further, as before this stone fortification, this point by the harbour entrance was once the site of an early wooden-built tower, which in the early 15th century was a prominent part of Portsmouth's defences and a major landmark for those approaching from the sea. Today, the stone round tower, still standing after 530 years, also gives some stunning views across the harbour and the Solent, a narrow stretch of water that was historically feared to be a potential route for an invading fleet of French naval ships. It was in response to this threat that the chain linking this point with Gosport across the water was intended to be raised, although nowadays there's less of a threat of a French naval invasion, with the entrance to Portsmouth's harbour mostly busy with ferries and sailing boats. As you'll likely know, Portsmouth Port is one of the busiest ferry terminals in England today, with boats sailing to a wide range of destinations. If you're looking to visit the Isle of Wight, the island is easiest accessed via Portsmouth, while boats from the port here also sail to the Channel Islands, northern France, and even as far away as Spain. We'll get a closer look at the ferry terminal later on, but here we're now walking among some rather more modern remains of Portsmouth's coastal defences. This area was once the Point Barracks, a military installation that was in operation for around 100 years, from the 1850s until the 1960s. From the old barracks windows, you can also see a small pebble beach that sits in the shadow of a long line of Portsmouth's huge old defensive walls. Those walls which buttress up against the barracks here were built in the 17th century and are known as the Hot Walls, a nickname which comes from days just like today where the grand south-facing walls get extremely hot from the beating sun. An extension of the city's defences started by Henry VII and Henry VIII, the hot walls here were built as an important link between two major towers in Portsmouth's walls, the round tower that we've just visited and another 15th century battlement, the square tower. And as we take in yet another view of the sparkling Portsmouth harbour from up on high, we'll now head towards the square tower. But rather than following the walkway on top of the hot walls, we're going to drop down to ground level, where you'll find a bit of shade from the scorching sun and some examples of how Portsmouth's mighty history has been preserved and in some cases repurposed for the modern day. The line of the hot walls, which runs parallel to Broad Street here, surrounds a calm open space in Old Portsmouth, with this small square home to a number of public artworks, indicative of the creative streak that this part of the city has taken on in recent years. In the 2010s, the Hot Walls were redeveloped as the so-called Hot Wall Studios, a line of 13 independent art studios housed within the arches here, although this recent birth of creativity isn't actually the first to have taken place here. In fact, back in the 1950s, when the Point Battery military installation based here was winding down, the Walls Arches became used by locals as the site of a popular Sunday art market. Local painters sold their works in the shade of the arches, and so there began a surprising association with art in this historically military-focused part of Portsmouth seafront. Of course, reminders of that military heritage are still everywhere to be seen at the Hot Walls, whose nickname, according to another theory, is suggested to actually derive from the practice of heating up cannonballs to make them more devastating when they were fired at an enemy ship out in the water. Cannons once stood right along the length of the Hot Walls, but here on our right we can see a small opening in the walls, a gateway known as the Old Sally Port. Now today, the Old Sally Port is the main entrance to the small, pebbled Hot Walls Beach, a popular place for sunbathing and fishing by the waters of the harbour. But once upon a time, it was through this gateway that countless sailors stepped out of Portsmouth and onto their ships, setting out, or sallying forth, to destinations all over the world where they fought some of Britain's most famous naval battles. 
Meanwhile, back in 1787, it was also from right here in Portsmouth that the first fleet of European settlers set sail for Australia, on board 11 ships that would arrive nine months later at Botany Bay in Sydney. But as well as a place where people left the country, the old Sally Port was also a symbolic point of arrival on many occasions, most famously in 1662, when the Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza landed in state at the old Sally Port, before she was met by King Charles II, whom she married in Portsmouth just a few steps away a week later. Now just along from the old Sally Port, we find another of the oldest battlements in Portsmouth's defensive walls, the Square Tower, built all the way back in 1494. Another important fortification overlooking the harbour entrance, the Square Tower has for long held special significance in Portsmouth, in particular, as the place where many locals have historically congregated to greet ships of all sorts arriving into the harbour, from modern aircraft carriers like HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Invincible, to historic vessels like HMS Victory, famously associated with the iconic Battle of Trafalgar and the Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson. Now all of those ships can be seen for real right here in Portsmouth, the modern aircraft carriers based here when not out on the high seas, and the likes of HMS Victory moored permanently in the city's immense historic dockyard, part of the sprawling National Museum of the Royal Navy. We won't have the chance to explore the dockyard on this walk today, but if you do visit Portsmouth it's an absolute must visit to learn more about Britain's proud maritime heritage. Here on top of the hot walls, however, we're continuing along the southwestern edge of what was the old fortified city of Portsmouth. Now, as we mentioned, it was under Henry VII that the first stone fortifications were built here in Portsmouth, before his son Henry VIII expanded the defences significantly, establishing Portsmouth as an important centre of England's naval power at the time. But as we see one of the many Isle of Wight shuttle ferries passing into the harbour in front of us here, these Tudor-era developments to Portsmouth's walls were far from the first built to protect the town. In fact, back in the 14th century, towns along England's south coast were regularly falling victim to a series of devastating attacks carried out by French raiders, and so the people of medieval Portsmouth built a collection of rudimentary earthworks to act as makeshift defences for the town. Those original earth defences are long gone today, and the majority of Portsmouth's fortifications that we see now date from the reign of King Charles II, a major figure in the city who we'll talk a little more about in a couple of minutes. But speaking of major figures, here we can see towards a statue of none other than Horatio Nelson, arguably the greatest figure in British naval history. This statue was erected in 1951, and it was originally placed a few hundred feet away in Pembroke Gardens, looking out towards South Sea Beach, where it's believed that Nelson in 1805 set out from England for the last time to board HMS Victory, bound for the Battle of Trafalgar. That original site for the statue became obscured by funfairs over the years, and so it now stands here, just off the route that Nelson walked from his lodgings at the George Hotel towards HMS Victory on that fateful morning. Famously, Nelson led Britain's navy to a crucial victory at Trafalgar, but he was fatally wounded during the battle, and his body was brought back to England aboard HMS Victory, arriving home here in Portsmouth, after which point the Vice Admiral was given a state funeral, such was his significance to the nation at the time. Nelson's legacy remains strong here in Portsmouth in particular, his life story on display at the Royal Navy Museum, and HMS Victory still standing tall in port. But here, we're looking down across what's known as the Long Curtain, a huge man-made moat between two strong city walls. On that morning in 1805, some of Nelson's final steps in England came as he crossed a small bridge over the Long Curtain, much like that we can see in front of us here, before making his way through the Sally Port and boarding HMS Victory. But the Long Curtain, and many of the defences surrounding it in this area of Portsmouth, were built over a hundred years before Nelson's time during the reign of King Charles II, who, as we mentioned, was closely associated with Portsmouth for the development of its fortifications. But that wasn't all. Just inland from the Long Curtain, we can see the remains of a large church historically known as the Domus Dei, and it was inside this very church that Charles II married his bride, 
the Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza, in 1662. As we mentioned earlier, Catherine arrived by sea and landed in state here in Portsmouth as she made her way through the sally port in the Hot Walls, although it was more than a week before she was met by her husband-to-be, the king. The pair married the following day here at the Domus Dei, although that wasn't their only wedding of the day. The service at the Domus Dei was a public royal wedding conducted according to Anglican tradition, but the king, known for his Catholic tendencies, and Catherine, a devout Catholic, also took part in a secret Catholic ceremony somewhere else in Portsmouth. But what of the church itself? Well, the Domus Dei has more than 800 years of history under what once stood of its roof. It was originally built around the year 1212 as a chapel that served as part of an almshouse and hospice, caring for the poor and sick of medieval Portsmouth. By the time of Charles and Catherine's wedding, however, the hospice had been closed down, initially converted into an ammunition store and later the home of the local military governor, before it went on to serve as the church serving the local military garrison, giving it its new name, the Royal Garrison Church. As for the church's roof, that was lost fairly recently in its history, during the Second World War, when the church was struck by the bombs of the Luftwaffe in 1941, and much of the building was destroyed. Despite that, the church still stands here as an intriguing landmark that links many different facets of Portsmouth's illustrious history. Not only the royal wedding that took place inside, but the interesting link between the city's military and religious past. In 1814, the Royal Garrison Church saw another major event as it hosted the great banquet celebrating the first defeat and abdication of Britain's old foe, Napoleon. Although these celebrations were perhaps a little premature, as Napoleon famously returned to power in France just a year later after escaping exile, before his second defeat at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Waterloo, a crucial military victory taken on land, came just ten years after Trafalgar, where Britain's victory, led by Vice Admiral Nelson, ensured the Royal Navy's effective supremacy over France at sea. And if there's anywhere which showcases that legacy of British naval supremacy, it's Portsmouth. We mentioned that HMS Victory, which led the fleet at Trafalgar, is today stationed at Portsmouth's historic dockyard. But while you can visit the ship for yourself, one thing you might be surprised to know is that HMS Victory is actually still in commission technically ready to serve as part of the Royal Navy in maritime conflict. While that would certainly be an interesting development in the 21st century, HMS Victory exists today as the world's oldest naval ship still in commission, having entered service 244 years ago, a symbol of the ship's enduring importance to Britain's naval heritage. But let's now break off for a bit from discussing Portsmouth's steep links with the sea, and venture a little further inland through the streets of this oldest part of the modern city. Here we find ourselves on the High Street, historically the busy centre of Portsmouth that was lined with houses and shops galore, while just to our right here is the site of the George Hotel, where Nelson stayed on the night before he set out for Trafalgar in 1805. Now you'll notice that the High Street today isn't much of a high street, more of a quiet residential area on the edge of the much larger modern city of Portsmouth, but there are a few things more indicative of the former significance of this area than the building which stands just behind these trees, Portsmouth Cathedral. Situated on what is today a leafy green at the heart of this mostly residential area, Portsmouth Cathedral has stood here for well over 800 years, originally built as the much smaller parish church of St Thomas of Canterbury back in the 1180s. Some fabric of that original medieval church remains, although the building was redeveloped and expanded through time as Portsmouth grew in size and stature over the centuries. Now the building of today, which was designated a cathedral in 1927, dates mostly from the late 17th and early 18th centuries, when it was substantially rebuilt in the aftermath of the English Civil War, during which time the church had taken on an important role in the fighting. In general, Portsmouth was a stronghold of parliamentarian sentiment during the war. The townspeople supported the Roundheads, and the harbour was a base for Parliament's navy. But the king also saw the value of this strategically important coastal town and so a small royalist garrison sought to hold Portsmouth for the king at the outset of the Civil War. The royalists blockaded Parliament's ships from reaching the sea, 
leading Parliament to lay siege to the town in the late summer of 1642. During that siege, St Thomas's Church here was used by the Royalist armies as a lookout post, but this inevitably led to it being targeted by parliamentarian shelling, with the church tower and central portion of the building heavily damaged during the war. Parliament eventually took total control of Portsmouth after a roughly month-long siege at the very beginning of the Civil War, although this wasn't the first time that Portsmouth Cathedral had been caught up in fighting and political strife. Back in the 14th century, the parish church here was actually one of the few buildings that survived the devastating French raids on the town of Portsmouth. But a hundred years later in the mid-15th century, Portsmouth's church was actually closed down entirely on the orders of none other than the Pope, after a group of local sailors had forcibly removed the Bishop of Chichester from a sermon at the Domuste nearby and murdered him. In revenge, the Pope excommunicated the entire town of Portsmouth, meaning that no church services could legally take place here, although this was later reversed when England broke with the Catholic Church and St Thomas's reopened. But having made our way away from Portsmouth Cathedral, we now find ourselves on Lombard Street, lined with an eye-catching array of historic townhouses that give us an idea of what the historic centre of Old Portsmouth looked like. But how on earth did this area change from the bustling commercial heart of one of England's most important coastal towns into the calm residential area it is today? Well, nowadays, Portsmouth city centre is situated about a mile to the northeast of here, a little further inland on Portsea Island. But it wasn't until the last 200 years that the centre of focus actually moved there. Old Portsmouth here, as it's known today, emerged on the southwest corner of Portsea Island, lining the sea from the late 12th century, around the time when the Church of St Thomas was first built. And as England and Britain's navies grew through the Tudor period and into the era of Nelson in the 19th century, the town status rose significantly, coming to be known as the world's greatest naval port by the turn of the 20th century. By this point, however, there was much more to Portsmouth than its links with the navy as a sprawling industrial sphere had grown to support the ships that were passing in and out of port here, causing the town to swell in size further inland across Portsea Island, as Portsmouth's population skyrocketed from just over 30,000 people in 1801 to nearly a quarter of a million people in 1901. Then, with the decline of the British Empire in the 20th century, the importance of Portsmouth's port began to fall as shipbuilding companies were closed down and less manpower was needed at the dockyard. As such, the densely populated areas further inland soon began to receive more attention, and we'll talk more about that shortly. But here we can see an example of the kind of place that was at the heart of life in Portsmouth for the majority of its history. Just up in front of us is Camber Quay, today home to Portsmouth's inshore fishing fleet, but which is the site of the oldest commercial docks in Portsmouth where ships historically docked to offload their goods. It's arguable too that Camber Quay was the genesis for the town of Portsmouth back in the medieval era, as back in the 1180s, this naturally sheltered harbour on England's south coast was recognised as the ideal place to establish a town for cross-channel trade between England and Normandy. It was for that very reason that a wealthy Norman merchant by the name of Jean de Gisors bought the land in this area of Portsea Island and founded the modern town of Portsmouth, which grew up around Camber Quay here and continued to balloon in size over the following 800 years. So that's why Old Portsmouth is situated in this area of Portsea Island, but the modern city is a whole different animal to the historically nautical settlement here down by the sea. Along with the decline of the British Empire impacting Portsmouth's dockyard and shipbuilding industry, the city was also affected by both world wars, said to have been bombed by Zeppelins in the First World War, although the Germans may have accidentally dropped their bombs into the harbour rather than the intended target of the dockyard. The Second World War, however, was much more devastating, as the Luftwaffe carried out no less than 67 air raids on Portsmouth between 1940 and 1944, a major campaign known as the Portsmouth Blitz which sought to cripple this highly significant south coast port. More than 900 people were killed in the Portsmouth Blitz, and over 13,000 houses were either destroyed or severely damaged, and so that's why you'll find so many new-build houses around Portsmouth today, 
with the largest housing developments built in the late 1940s, the 60s and the 70s. As we can see in the distance meanwhile, Portsmouth is also home to its fair share of tall towers, even skyscrapers, an example of how the city has now become home to a much greater diversity of modern industries. Most notably, Portsmouth is home to the national and in some cases continental headquarters of large multinational corporations, including the Zurich Insurance Group and the tech firm IBM, who came to the city in the late 20th century as Portsmouth stockyards declined and its modern city centre became the heart of economic activity. Portsmouth today is also home to its own university of more than 20,000 students and a variety of shopping and cultural centres that make it a really rather lively modern city. But the sea still holds great importance, particularly thanks to its famous ferry port. Here, we're passing by the ferry terminal for the always busy Isle of Wight shuttle ferries, which make the roughly 45-minute journey across the Solent to Fishbourne on the Isle of Wight multiple times a day. But as we mentioned, the Isle of Wight isn't the only place you can reach by boat from here. A short way to the north of the historic dockyard, you'll find Portsmouth's huge international ferry terminal, the point from which ferries bound for France, Spain and the Channel Islands depart, and which also serve cargo ships bringing goods in and out of Britain. The ferry port is a major employer in the modern city, and it stands alongside the operational naval base on Portsmouth seafront as an important reminder of the city's spectacular maritime history the naval base itself home to two-thirds of the modern British surface fleet. As we've spoken about, the Navy has been based here at Portsmouth for a long, long time, in fact as long ago as the early 13th century, when King John established the first permanent naval base here on the south coast, although the current base is situated around the busy dockyard that was at the centre of Portsmouth's greatest era of prosperity in the 19th century. Of course, the 19th century was a period of dramatic development in almost all areas of life in Britain, a number of which were driven by famous historical figures who lived in or were even born right here in Portsmouth. One important figure who called Portsmouth home was Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the revolutionary engineer behind Bristol's Clifton Suspension Bridge and the innovative vessel the SS Great Britain. Brunel was born here in 1806 to his engineer father, Mark Isambard Brunel, who famously provided the revolutionary machinery to the Portsmouth block mills at the dockyard. Just six years after Brunel's birth, none other than Charles Dickens was born in Landport, what is now the modern city centre of Portsmouth. Dickens' birthplace in the city centre is now a museum, although the iconic author didn't spend all too long in Portsmouth, moving away to London at the age of just three years old. Passing by Portsmouth Point, where we began our walk, we've now made our way around the Isle of Wight ferry terminal to be strolling alongside Portsmouth Harbour, in a rather more recently developed area of the seafront. This area of the city is known as Gun Wharf Keys, once upon a time the site of a naval storage facility, and the huge building that we can see just in the distance here is the old Grand Storehouse, built in 1814 to house everything from cannons to guns and more, ready to be used by Britain's forces on land or at sea. Today the Grand Storehouse has a rather different purpose, home to a collection of shops that form part of what is now a busy retail centre by the sea, situated on the site of what was the old Gun Wharf, an important 18th century development in Portsmouth that furthered the town's expansion away from the heart of old Portsmouth that we've been exploring so far. Before the 18th century, however, this area of Portsmouth was mostly underwater, and it was only through land reclamation work that the old gun wharf was built, signalling that the historic town of old Portsmouth was becoming too small for the needs of this rapidly growing naval port. The old gun wharf here then was built in 1706, but as Britain's navy grew further through the 18th century, it soon became apparent that another gun wharf was needed to supply the nation's maritime forces, and it was built just across the water from us here, where the soaring Spinnaker Tower now stands today. Together, the so-called twin gun wharves served an important role in supplying Britain's naval forces through the Napoleonic Wars and the two world wars, and in the modern day we can see reminders of the very boats that the gun wharves served. Here in the shadow of the Spinnaker Tower, there stands the fetching figurehead of the HMS Marlborough, 
a huge sailing ship built in 1855 that was converted for use in conflict. Now the HMS Marlborough was actually the last vessel of its kind to have a figurehead like this, and while the ship was scrapped in 1925, this spectacular feature was preserved as a reminder of the majestic ships of the Royal Navy. We'll see another figurehead of a former naval ship in a few moments too, as one of a number of maritime relics that you'll find alongside a small canal emptying out into the harbour here at the foot of the Spinnaker Tower. Now we mentioned a few moments ago that before the development of the old gun wharf in 1706, this area of Portsmouth was mostly underwater, as there existed a small pond known as the Mill Pond, roughly where the small canal beside us exists today. But before wider areas of land were reclaimed from the sea for more modern development, this part of Portsmouth was the site of activity as far back as the 12th century, when a small dock was developed under King Richard I in the early days of Portsmouth's naval career. Centuries later, however, the site of that medieval dock is filled with history, and up ahead we can see a towering quayside crane, which was built in the early 20th century to onload and offload bulk goods and equipment. The crane is one of a number of interesting little features to be seen in the Gun Wharf Keys, and on the ground just down below it, there's an old torpedo, a Mark 8 21-inch torpedo to be specific, the type of which was used extensively by submarines during the Second World War, and which notably were employed in the Falklands War in the sinking of the Argentine cruiser Belgrano. As the home of a large proportion of Britain's naval fleet, it was from Portsmouth that the main fleet set out for the Falklands after the Argentine invasion in 1982, waved off by vast crowds lining the waterfront as the ships made their way out of the harbour. At that time, the Gunwharf Quays had been left mostly vacant by the decline of Portsmouth's busy port, but today the area is full of sleek, modern buildings with the exception of this, the old Customs House, a beautifully restored building of 1790 that's now a popular canal-side pub. The old Customs House has had a variety of uses throughout time, most notably as the home of the headquarters of HMS Vernon, although despite its name, this Vernon wasn't a grand ship. Instead, HMS Vernon was a so-called stone frigate of the Royal Navy, based in a building here on shore that served as the Navy's torpedo school founded in the 1870s. Here though, there stands the figurehead of the original HMS Vernon, a real naval gunship launched in 1832 which lent its name to the Torpedo School, and which later went on to be used by students of the school as a training vessel. The history of the Torpedo School is why you'll find a number of old torpedoes on display beside the canal which make for some rather intriguing decoration for what is now one of the most popular destinations in all of Portsmouth. As we mentioned in the late 20th century, the Gunwharf Quays here had become a bit of a wasteland, neglected as the port declined, but in 2001, the area was redeveloped and reopened as a brand new shopping centre, known still as Gunwharf Quays. The Gunwharf Quays shopping centre is a huge mall complete with shops, restaurants, a cinema and offices to boot, all of which have helped to draw in more people to this area of Portsmouth even as its military and economic importance has declined. And of course this part of the city remains iconic not just for the wealth of history on display, but as the home of the Spinnaker Tower, the defining landmark of Portsmouth's modern seafront. As we mentioned at the start of our walk, the Spinnaker Tower takes its name from the Spinnaker, a type of sail on which the tower's design is modelled, and which provides a spectacular figure that watches over the harbour, the Gunwharf Quays and Old Portsmouth, where we've spent most of our walk today. Now there's so much more to Portsmouth than just the area we've explored. The historic dockyard and Royal Navy Museum are huge and absolutely enthralling to visit, while the modern city centre is where the main day-to-day -day action is but I hope you've enjoyed it all the same as we've strolled through the centuries by the sea on this gorgeous day. In the shadow of the Spinnaker Tower now though, we've reached the end of our walk around Portsmouth. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're looking forward to visiting Portsmouth for yourself sometime soon.